Hello everyone and welcome to our Enterprise Ireland UK webinar, Warehousing in the UK in collaboration with the United Kingdom Warehousing Association. My name is Kevin Fenley and I am the Market Advisor for Engineering and Agriculture based here in our London office. Over the next hour, we'll take a look at the topic of warehousing in the UK and your options for holding stock in the market. Over the past two years, we've seen a heightened number of Irish companies setting up a presence in the UK due to the challenges presented by Brexit. And more recently, we've seen an uptick in companies across our different sectors that we cover in Enterprise Ireland, looking at their options from a warehousing perspective in the market and being met with a challenging warehousing market here in Britain. The goal of today's session is to provide an overview of the options available to you as an Irish company in the market and provide our tips on how to approach different warehousing providers in the UK. In terms of an agenda for today's session, we will hear first from Paul Johnson of Model Logic, who will present the key takeaways from our Guide to UK Warehousing report, which was commissioned by Enterprise Ireland in collaboration with the United Kingdom Warehousing Association, or UKWA, as it's commonly known. Then we will move on to our panel discussion, where Paul will be joined by Claire Bottle, Chief Executive of the UKWA, and Neil Boker, Director of Boker Group, to discuss the state of the UK Warehousing Association and their advice for Irish companies looking at the market. My colleague Jack Coonan, who is on the call today, will also pose your questions to the panel during that discussion. So please pop any questions you may have in the questions tab below. Before we start, um, a few big pieces from our side as ever. Um, and we just wanted to get a feel for who is on our call today. And we're just going to pop up a quick poll, which we would hope that you can answer. Um, do you currently hold stock in the UK? We want to get a sense of those who are on the call, whether you are looking at the opportunity in the UK or whether you are reviewing your existing, um, we say logistics and supply chain in the UK. So if you please pop in questions, I see questions slowly but surely are answers coming through there. So I'll just give you 20 seconds or so. And thanks for everyone for joining um, while we're just running through this. Um, I'll just give you a few more seconds for anyone who may not have put in their answers. Now, just to present the poll. So it should be popping up on your screen um, in that quick poll we put, put there, roughly 40% of you on today's call already hold stock in the UK, um, be it in a shared warehouse or your own warehouse, and 60% of you are, are not in that position yet. So that should frame the discussion we have today around whether it's a starting point for companies or whether it's a, a review piece. And, and thanks, thanks for those who've added your kind of answers there. So just moving on, a brief introduction um, to ourselves in Enterprise Ireland. Um, we are, as many of you will know, the Irish Development Agency for Trade and Innovation, supporting over 5,000 companies to grow on scale in global markets. This is done through our head office in Dublin and our 40 plus offices around the world. In the UK, here, we have offices here in London and in Manchester, where sector specialists support our Irish companies with market intelligence and knowledge and work with UK companies to help them source their next innovation coming out of Ireland. I touched on it earlier and, and Paul, Paul uh, Johnson, who compiled our report, will, will go in more depth following my brief presentation here. But by way of an introduction, we've developed this guide to UK warehousing to act as a, a starting point for Irish companies looking at warehousing in the UK to provide a steer in terms of options for companies in the market and key considerations our companies should take on board in this area. My colleague Jack will drop the PDF into the chat, hopefully, um, as I'm chatting here, and we'll send out a PDF following today's session. So hopefully uh, we think it's a great resource from our side uh, and really looking forward to uh, having everyone engage with it. And just finally, uh, the last word from my point, uh, we are, of course, using Zoom today, uh, as many of you will be well accustomed with. Um, your mics and video should be muted at this point. If you have any questions or comments, please pop them in the chat or in the questions tab, which you will see in the bottom of your screen there. Um, we have a lot of some time in our panel discussion for Q&A, and we would welcome any questions you may have during that time. And we would like to thank the many of you who sent in questions in advance. Uh, any questions we cannot get to in today's webinar, we'll be sure to follow up on email. Um, and without any further ado from my side, um, I'll now like to hand you over to Paul Johnson of Model Logic. Paul, over to you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm behind the uh, development of the report. So we spent the last uh, month or so doing quite a bit of research on the UK uh, marketplace. Um, I've done a lot of work in the past with um, uh, Board Beer and with uh, Enterprise Island, uh, uh, trying to help Irish companies find solutions into the UK market. So uh, this is quite a common ground for, for myself. 
Um, I'd like to make a quick start, really just talking about the impact of Brexit. Um, the impact of Brexit on Irish exporting business is still evolving. Uh, as companies come to terms with the new business environment and the different ways of working. One of the consequences of Brexit has been that there is now uh, considerably more administration and paperwork required for Irish companies to complete in order to supply their UK customers. Transport companies have had to adapt their ways of working and accept more responsibilities for customs processing and seeking the ideal ferry routes for servicing the UK and the rest of Europe. Some transport companies have scaled back their operations to the UK, particularly the small drop or group agenda of the business. With this background, many Irish businesses have already considered holding stock in the UK to mitigate risks and also to provide shorter lead times for their customer deliveries. This thinking is also mirrored by other European businesses wishing to hold more stock in the UK. Other factors currently affecting the industry include the energy price increases, labour shortages, higher pay rates, alternative energy sources and automation. These parameters mean that decision-making is very multi-dimensional. So this joint Enterprise Ireland and UK um, WA report is intended as an introductory guide for Irish businesses who are considering seeking a warehouse solution in the UK. Options will include contracting with a warehouse operator, to provide storage and handling services, or renting space and managing the operations in-house. Some larger companies may even consider buying a warehouse to run their operations, the UK operations. Given that most of the clients um, of Enterprise Ireland are SMEs, the main focus of the report is on shared user warehouse. Okay, Kevin, thank you. In its latest 2021 UK warehousing sector report, um, the property agent and research company Savills indicated that the total footprint of warehousing space above 100,000 square feet is approximately 566 million square feet. And this accounts for approximately 2,000 sites in the UK. The East Midlands has the highest percentage of the total at 20%, with the southeast, which includes London, at 21%. Scotland and Wales account for about 5% of the building stock. Regions which have shown recent growth from a lower base are the northeast, the southwest, and Yorkshire and the Humber. Logistics service providers, or LSPs as we'll refer to them, have the highest proportion with 24% of the total. High street retailers, share has reduced from 27% to 20%, and on, online retail has grown from 3% to 14%, reflecting the shift from store to online sales. Other key observations that have taken place in 2021 was at a, at a record high of over 55 million square feet. The vacancy rate is now at its lowest ever at below 3%. New supply was low at 17 million square feet. So that is approximately 3% of the total being added in 2021. New warehouses are tending to have a larger footprint and are higher. Uh, Amazon has accounted for 25% of the larger formats. The LSP sector is estimated to operate 106 million uh, square feet of warehouse, which has increased 41% over the past six years. The sector is divided into two types of contract. A dedicated warehouse contract, which is where an LSP operates on behalf of a single client, and a shared user warehouse, which is where an LSP operates for a number of small, smaller clients, sharing the cost of the operation. The, the percentage split between the two hasn't been researched. Next, please. The majority of shared user warehouses operate at ambient temperature and use standard adjustable rack pallet racking. In order to increase the storage capacity of the warehouse, the racking may be double deep. 
for taller warehouses, very narrow aisle racking may be used with supporting cranes. Other more automated solutions may be used, but are not typical in the shared user and facility. Drive-in, drive-through or mobile racking are generally not used. Automation is more difficult to justify in a shared user environment as it doesn't provide the flexibility required with numerous different clients on shorter term contracts with varying product specifications and case dimensions. Block stacking of pallets is possible when there is no risk of crushing and is useful in low rise buildings, in overflow areas of the warehouse or for fast moving high volume pallets. Cantilever racking is required for longer length products, for example, timber, pipes, or rolls of material. The warehouse operations can either be full pallet movements or a proportion of case picking. Where case or item picking is required, various storage and handling systems can be employed and utilize conveyor or mobile robotics for movements between different warehouse zones. Some example storage methods for cases or items include glow racks, shelving, vertical carousels, and live racking. Special systems will be required for hanging garments. Next, please, Kevin. Shared user warehouses tend to accommodate clients with similar storage and handling requirements. Some products require specific accreditations or licenses for storage and handling. We have identified six main types of operation. Any specific site could provide a combination of the six. General ambient pallet storage warehouses offer the traditional services of receiving inbound pallets, storage and picking for outbound deliveries, either as pallets or as cases. Storage can be arranged on a spot hire basis or dedicated reserved areas for use by individual clients. Fulfillment or e-commerce businesses provide the logistic services to fulfill orders generated from a client's online store. Facilities usually operate a small reserve store of pallets, which are then used to replenish picking systems, such as flow racks, shelving, bins, or more sophisticated goods to person solutions. Assembled orders are packed into boxes and distributed using parcel carriers or a pallet network. The final customers are usually household consumers, but B2B services are available. The key aspect of e-commerce fulfillment is the technology which links the client's website and ordering platform together with the track and trace system for monitoring the delivery. A key feature of fulfillment operations is the requirement for a returned processing solution. Bonded facilities have been qualified by HMRC to allow goods to be stored without having to pay duties and VAT until dispatched. There are two types of bonded warehouse. Wet bonded warehouses are mainly used for storing alcohol and cigarettes, whilst dry bonded cover all other products. Bonded warehouses are used for imported products where a significant level of stock is held and the levels of excise duty are high. Hazardous goods must be stored in facilities with the appropriate systems in place to handle the potentially dangerous products. Special certifications are required, such as the control of major accidents and hazards, or COMA. Safety and quality control are fundamental to the operations, and companies must continually prove that they have the emergency responses in place, supported by highly efficient IT systems. Specialist licenses are required for handling products such as pharmaceutical and veterinary drugs. Here, the operations must be operated within controlled conditions and to a high level of accuracy in order to remove the risks of contamination. Temperature controlled warehouses maintain the temperature within prescribed ranges, which can be ambient, chilled or frozen. The temperature must be controlled not only within the storage chambers, but also in the receiving and dispatch areas of all associated transport. Products that require a temperature controlled environment 
include some pharmaceuticals, food, drinks, and certain flowers. Next seven. <clears throat> As well as the more general warehousing operations, uh, some clients will require additional services. Most UK warehouse operators will also provide a transport solution for mainland distribution, either using their own fleet of vehicles or arranging with third party hauliers. Some operators can also arrange transport to Europe, usually using third party hauliers. I have listed a few others here on the, on the screen. Uh, but they, these are more fully described in the report. <clears throat> Move on to uh, costings. Uh, the structure of the LSP's pricing agreement will depend upon the scale and the complexity of the operation. It is assumed that all the charges will be in pounds. The simplest arrangement for a full pallet in and full pallet out operation is structured in two main elements. Receiving, handling and dispatch, or RH&D, which is charged as a pound per pallet, in pounds per pallet. The second is the storage cost per week, which is charged as pounds per pallet per week or a part thereof. The charges for picking cases to meet customer orders depends upon how many SKUs are stored, the number of SKUs per order, and the number of cases per order. Given the profile of orders, the LSP will evaluate the work content required to pick orders and then provide a charge rate for the task. This is usually as a pound in pounds per case picked. Other charges can include shrink wrapping, pallet conversion, labelling, and administration. They will all be charged separately. The LSB may suggest a minimum level of stock holding for the contract. This may also be a factor that the LSB considers when deciding whether to bid for the contract at the beginning. <clears throat> for larger dedicated contracts, an open book contract might be suggested where the LSB shares the cost of the operation and agrees a management fee or markup on top of the base cost. The costs of allocated overheads need to be agreed carefully. The management fee can be a performance related and the client and the LSB jointly manage the risks of the operation. Fulfillment operations where a high proportion of the activity is in picking and packing of orders is typically charged is based on a simple table of rates, dependent upon the number of orders per month and the number of items per order. Separate charges are made for storage, either per pallet or per meters cubed. A monthly subscription fee may also be levied. The cost of the parcel delivery will depend upon if it is next day delivery or more standard two to three days delivery, together with if it is going to be tracked or not. The client should ensure that all aspects of the warehouse and transport operation are covered either by their own or the LSP's insurances. Given the 2022 increases in energy prices, many warehouse operators have introduced energy surcharges, which are reviewed on a weekly basis in a similar way to transport fuel surcharges. Next please. When, uh, <clears throat> when considering the ideal location for your warehouse, two factors are important. Firstly, the service time is the time to travel from the warehouse to your customers in order to meet their delivery lead times. Requiring a same day delivery would either limit the territory that could be covered or, required or require more than one warehouse. Typically, customers order on day one for delivery on day three. This means that most locations within the central GB belt can provide the required service time. The total cost to serve is the sum of the cost of transporting goods from Ireland to the UK, plus the cost of warehousing, 
in the UK and plus the cost of the final delivery to your customers. The cost to serve will be influenced by the location of the warehouse and also the port of entry into the UK. The cost of land and labour will vary for different regions of the country, with London and the southeast being the most expensive. This regional differential may be reflected in what the warehouse operators wish to charge. When assessing the financial cost of selecting the location for a new warehouse operation, it is rec recommended that the total cost to serve is calculated and compared with other possible locations and provider options. In a market where warehouses are operating close to capacity uh, and the ideal location isn't e immediately available, it may not be practical to achieve your lowest cost to serve. You may have heard of the Golden Triangle, which is an area in the East Midlands of, uh, of England, which is renowned for its high density of distribution facilities and being close to GB's geographical central population. It has access to over 90% of the UK population within a four hours drive from this area. Although this is a good location for reaching your customers, it may not be ideal from a total cost to serve point of view, when you also include the primary transport from Ireland and the cost of operating the warehouse. Next, Kevin. Demonstrating green credentials is a key point of difference for warehouse operators and is an important consideration in the procurement of warehouse services. Due to the rising prices of electricity, decisions on energy usage are now very much focused on costs as well as carbon usage. The main operational factors impacting on the energy use within the warehouse are shown on the slide. The use of electricity, here, uh, considerations might include the purchasing of green energy from suppliers, intelligent lighting, including daylight and pres presence detecting controls, low energy LED fittings, solar panels, the use of electric forklifts. The building design, which covers airtight, avoiding the site being airtight, avoiding drafts and opening uh, doors having suitable cladding to minimize potential heat loss, roof lights to maximize the use of daylight, and having a, a high BRIAM rating. Resource management include perhaps using a combined heat and power or a biomass system, using high efficiency boilers with thermostatically controlled radiators, having high volume, low speed fans for circulation and avoiding warm air being trapped in the ceiling, rainwater harvesting, uh, waste management, including packaging. Warehouse location and network strategy is a very important green consideration. The warehouse location and its impact on the distances traveled by transport has a significant impact on the use of fuel. The use of energy increases where automated equipment is used and within temperature controlled warehouse. So rather than using the services of LSP, some clients may wish to rent space from a landlord or buy their, buy their own warehouse. This approach is more applicable to larger established companies who have experience in managing their own warehouse operations. In these situations, the client becomes responsible for all aspects of the warehouse operation, including operating methods, management, operator recruitment, IT and, and administration. In order to research and identify an appropriate facilities, it is recommended that advice is sought from established property agents. The structure and contents of any warehouse lease agreement is crucial for ongoing financial security and risk management. Uh, UKWA members can receive support on legal matters and access are copies of UKWA's standard lease document. As an alternative, there are a number of companies providing warehouse property or space search websites, and many of these are described in the report. Okay, with that, I'll just move on to the next slide. 
I'll just hand you back to uh, Kevin to start the Q and A. Brilliant. Thanks, William, for that, Paul. I think that was a very insightful presentation, and I think our clients will agree that the report is a very useful resource and a great starting point when looking at the market. Jack has just popped the report in the chat, so feel free to download it on your side. Um, I will now, at this point, just ask Claire, Neil, and Jack to pop back on their cameras and unmute themselves, if that's okay. Um, I see him coming back online there. Um, as discussed earlier, um, Jack will be posing your questions to our panel and please continue to pop questions in the questions tab below on your screen as a number you have already. I see questions coming in from Neil and Paul there earlier on, which, which Jack will, will, will share with our, with our panel today. So I think a great place to start, um, particularly with um, Neil and Claire joining us here, will be some brief introductions to your, yourself and the company. And I think I'll start with you, Claire, if you could introduce a bit about your role and the UKWA, as I'm, many, I'm sure many of our SMEs mightn't have encountered your association in the market. So I might hand it over to you first. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for having me, Kevin. And thank you for partnering with us on this uh, exciting new report. I hope the people listening uh, will find it really useful and valuable. Uh, so the UK Warehousing Association is a long established uh, logistics trade association. We've got about 900 members and our members are companies uh, and the majority of those are the, the, what uh, Paul's been describing as LSP, so logistics service providers uh, who operate warehousing across the UK. Um, and uh, I've been the chief executive here since uh, last July. And prior to that, I worked in operational logistics for about 25 years. So that's me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Claire. Over to you, Neil. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and Boker? Yeah, of course, Cam. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil Bowker. I'm the commercial director for WH Bowker. Uh, we're a privately owned third party logistics provider. Uh, based typically in the north of England. Um, we operate seven sites across the UK. We have 1.2 million square feet of warehousing, which is about 110,000 pallets in stock at any one time. Um, we have 200 vehicles and about 400 trailers. We're large members of the pallet networks within the UK, both for hazardous and non-hazardous. And we, do, we handle anything from a kilo through to a full trailer load. And that's basically me. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Neil. Um, and I think that sets the scene well. And, and thanks again for joining our panel. And I think Paul touched on it briefly, and we see with it in, in, a, in one of the questions in the chat touches upon it. And I might go to you on this question, Claire, around can you tell us a bit about where UK warehousing is at currently and uh, be it the, the challenges and opportunities at play there? And if you could give an introduction to our clients into that space. Yeah, sure. So warehousing has been growing across the UK. Uh, in the past six years or so, we've seen uh, the warehousing market grow by about 32 percent. Um, and uh, what that's really meant is that government's taking more and more interest in supply chains and, and particularly in warehousing. Um, so we're seeing this growth. We're seeing some new entrants into the market. And we're also seeing uh, growth for existing members of the UK Warehousing Association. Um, I think uh, one of the things that's behind this is the growth of e-commerce. So when you're preparing goods in a warehouse, ready to dispatch them to consumers' home addresses, that takes up more space and more labour than preparing goods, uh, say, to dispatch as materials into a manufacturing process or as finished consumer goods to a retail outlet. Uh, so part of the reason for the growth in, in warehouse space is because more activities are taking place in warehouses. But there's another factor, uh, which is about the sort of um, ideology of just-in-time logistics, which relied very much on um, holding as little stock as possible. Uh, and companies are tending to move away from that because they want to be able to deliver very high levels of customer service. Um, and they want to protect their supply chain against uh, unexpected shocks. Uh, you may remember the Ever Given that got stuck in the Suez Canal uh, last year. Um, and of course, you know, we've, we've had the impact of COVID as well, which has uh, interrupted some supply chains. And those sorts of things um, are causing anxiety for some manufacturing companies and, and persuading them that they would rather hold more stock to protect against that. So those twin activities of, uh, you know, uh, the, the move away from just in time towards more resilient supply chains and the adoption of more packaging type activities in warehouses are, are two of the main themes that we're seeing that are making the warehouse market bigger and bigger. 
Thanks for that, Claire. And, and you touched on a number of the factors at play to we'd say what we see in the media around the, the limitations of space in the UK, currently in the warehousing space. And I suppose from your point of view, Neil, positive that your, your warehouses are full, that there's stock flowing through constantly. And, and I suppose the cha- it does present in a, cha- a challenge in some respects when, when you're speaking to new potential customers and just keen to hear how all the market forces, we'd say that Claire touched on, we'd say be it the space constraints or Ukraine or additional stock, how that plays out at warehouse level and, and how things are at Boker at the moment. Yeah, okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, yeah, Claire touched on the major um, in, in impacts that we're actually feeling. We've had Brexit, we've had COVID, we've had the change in um, the changing people's buying habits. Basically where we are at the moment, occupation is very, very high in the, in, within the warehouses. We're operating warehouses beyond 100%, which isn't efficient. Typically, we're looking for uh, efficiency rates of about 85%, which means that the warehouse is working at its ultimate. Um, and uh, unfortunately, at this moment in time, because the customers um, have increased stockholding, we're finding it very, very difficult to, um, to find additional space to uh, accommodate these demands. Uh, prices are going up per square foot in the, uh, in the marketplace. There seems to be a bit of a disconnect between the developer and the operator as far as rates are concerned. Um, and it's a, a very, very difficult marketplace. How we try and um, speak, deal with the customer is we ask for forecasts and then we set limits for people to, for, for businesses to work between. Um, they take in seasonality and, um, and other aspects of, of, of the, the customer's business in the UK. But it, it we have to evaluate every opportunity that presents itself, but we ask for the full scope of what the, the actual requirement is and how much picking and packing and you know what the labour demands are going to be. But it is, at this moment in time, a challenging marketplace. Thanks, Neil. It's great to get the view from, from the warehouse side on that. And conscious there, there's a number of questions coming in from our client companies here, and I might hand it over to you, Jack. Do you want to pose one of those questions to the panel? Yeah, thanks, Kevin, uh, and thanks, everyone, for your input so far into the Q&A uh, and your questions beforehand. We've had a couple of questions, I suppose, around the, the pros and cons of holding stock in the UK and conscious that some of our companies would be um, holding stock in the UK currently and some will be dealing directly uh, from Ireland and, and, and using the shipping routes there. Uh, Jim has posed a question to the chat um, around shipping directly. And I suppose, Paul, I might go to, to you on that one in terms of, um, could you tell us a little bit about the pros and cons of holding stock in the UK versus some of the alternatives that our companies uh, might be using, such as direct uh, from Ireland to the UK? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I think really holding stock as close to the customers is really uh, the lead times of and the reliability of the supply to those customers, isn't it really? So um, that's one of the main reasons we, we might consider holding stock in the in the UK. Um, being able to service within two days or even three days may not be feasible um, direct from from Ireland, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think the, uh, the the risk of um, not too much, <laughs> not not too much, uh, perhaps with the weather we're having at the moment. But uh, um, there are risks of um, delays on ferries, um, strikes on ferries. Um, these you know, lead people to you know, want to have the stock in in the UK to service the. Uh, service the customers. Um, I think you've got to really look at the whole supply chain and where stock is to, and whether you're supplying wholesalers or whether you're supplying direct to retailers or direct to customers. Who's holding stock in the supply chain? If, if you're supplying wholesalers in the UK who are already holding a lot of stock, um, you may not need to the lead times for you delivering may not be as short if you're trying to supply a retail operation. So um, <clears throat> knowing where the stock sits is, uh, is, is quite important there. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, I, I think to, to look from the point of view now of the companies on the call and conscious 60% of those 
don't currently have warehousing space and might be in the position that, that Jack touched on there. And many of those have been dealing with the UK post Brexit for over two years and might have finally decided, look, we want to take up warehousing space in the UK, as Paul touched on, and get closer to the customer. But obviously they're presented with the challenges around warehousing space and having to take up with a certain amount of stock in a warehouse or however it might be. And, and I think I want to go to you on this, Neil, if that's okay, around your advice for customers or Irish companies coming to the UK and the discussion they have at warehouses, how would you advise our companies in terms of how they present themselves to warehouses and what should they have in line, be it forecast or otherwise, when starting a discussion with a warehouse? Um, the job needs to be spec'd out and scoped out and provided to the, uh, the 3PL in, in an in a understandable manner. Um, we need to know um, typically the uh, the stock holding, how many SKUs, I think Paul touched on this in his report, how many SKUs, the frequency of pick, um, shelf lives, typical arrangements on FIFO, which is first in, first out, um, anything to do with and the seasonality of, the, of, of the, the job. We just need to know as much information as possible. And then beyond that, we need then to know, um, we can then resource accordingly, but we need to know how the information is going to be transferred between the businesses um, because it's important that we, the flow of information is in the correct manner. And we talk about EDI links and, and all these sort of methods of communication um, that means that it's an efficient process. That's typically the advice that I would provide. Um, but it is all around the scoping and making sure you give a true reflection of what you're actually looking to do. Um, and then if there's aspirations for growth, what the what those growth spurts are when they're planned um and it's also people sort of if there's new product coming on board a, a new skew that's going to transform the business that information needs to be provided to the to the service provider thanks neil i think yeah ensuring that our companies are prepared for those discussions that are very important and you, you touched on we say how information is shared and it, it's a topic that came up in discussions with companies around what should our clients be looking for on the flip side from a warehouse provider and how do those agreements, what do those agreements look like? And I might go to you, Claire and those, if you could tell us a bit about, we'd say, how the UK, uh, WA, your terms of service and is there anything in particular, be it accreditations or IT that our, our, our company should be looking for from their providers in the market? Yeah, sure. So um, if I can just go back to sort of uh, thread together some of the comments from the previous questions, um, as Paul was explaining, um, one of the reasons why companies may choose to hold goods here in the UK might be because they would expect to get better customer service levels, whether that's uh, simply a faster delivery or also eliminating some of the potential failure points in the journey. Um, why would they be doing that at all? Well, um, Part of the reason for that is to try and stimulate market growth. You might expect to get um, repeat business from existing customers or from recommendations if you can demonstrate that your service levels are really good. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why uh, people might want to, to hold goods uh, in, in the UK rather than delivering direct uh, from the Republic of Ireland. Um, and, and I think also uh, from the UK Warehousing Association's point of view, we would strongly recommend that if you're not familiar with the market, uh, a good rule of thumb would be to look for a, a warehouse operator, which is a member of the UK Warehousing Association. Uh, you can find details of our members on the website. And of course, in the report, there's a, a, um, some examples and case studies uh, of some of those members. Uh, we've got hundreds of members. So from very large companies to very small ones and uh, covering the whole geography of the UK. Again, I think Paul was explaining um, that uh, different types of uh, service levels and different sorts of providers will suit different customers. So um, as Neil was saying, it's really important to be clear about what it is that you want to achieve uh, and what you're looking for from a provider uh, and then have a look at um, the UK Warehousing Association's members, uh, and we're bound to have a member uh, that can help you. Um, and if I can just build on that point, I do think it would be worth mentioning uh, the UK WA conditions of contract as well. So uh, this is a, a kind of standard set of terms of doing business, which uh, most of our members adopt. 
um, and that would form part of a contract between uh, the, the company in Ireland and their warehouse provider in the UK. Those conditions of contract are very, very well established. Uh, and so they would cover a, a whole range of different areas where, there are where there's potential for disagreement or risk. Um, because let's be honest, uh, many of the problems that you might face have been faced before uh, and the conditions help to address them. Thanks for that, Claire. And, and we'll be sure to, to share those conditions of the contract um, piece uh, with our follow-up email, which will also provide the slides and the PDF of the report. So thanks for that, Claire. And you mentioned in your first point that service piece is essential for our companies. And for, for many a year, they were able to service the market, met much of our companies from Ireland. And I know on the agriculture side, a two-day delay in a part getting to the market is a huge factor for our companies and, and has really driven towards holding stock in the market. So totally agree with you on that side. And conscious, uh, again, there, there's more questions coming in and I might go back to you, Jack, if there's any questions from your side. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thanks everyone for, for getting involved and uh, for any questions we don't get to, as Kevin has said, we'll, we'll be sure to follow up after the webinar. But I suppose there's quite a few questions coming in around uh, costs and uh, uh, prices for, for for different cost structures, particularly um, for for Neil um, uh, around uh, particular costs uh, that might come in. But um, I suppose Neil, we would have talked previously about um, how it's difficult to to maybe give specific costs, um, and, and given that there's a, a lot of variability. Um, but if maybe uh, you could touch a bit about kind of general structures and and, and how. Um, how companies should maybe approach costs and, and, and how they could look at costs in, in, in a certain way? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, costs depend upon the, the actual requirement of the job. Um, but typically, as Paul uh, outlined in his presentation, we work on an rh &D, which is for the receipt and the dispatch of the pallet. Uh, and then we work on a weekly uh, storage price per pallet. Um, that's the typical basis that we're operating to. Um, there's then all the variables beyond that, the, the added value services that people provide um, that then have to be, uh, it's all down to scoped, being, being scoped out, carved out, and then itemized on a, on a tariff. Um, pretty straightforward, really. Um, it's not, not, not rocket science. Um, pretty straightforward. And, and just as a follow up to, to that, I suppose, if your company does have um, certain requirements, definitely would encourage maybe following the, the webinar to, to engage with, with ourselves. And, and if, if there's certain issues that, that maybe we can, uh, we can point you in the right direction towards figuring out your costs. Yeah. And costs are, so, the costs are associated to, <clears throat> you know, the design of the warehouse, the racking configurations, the IT capabilities of what the interaction between the two businesses um, it's the skill set of the staff, what's required to operate the warehouse. Um, and then if there's compliance requirements for, say, farmer or coma, uh, it's, it's all the sort of the back office functions that are required to make sure that the, the building's working, uh, you know, the warehouses are working in a, a safe and compliant manner. Thanks for that, Neil. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Can I just add something on that, Sam? Yeah, I think... Cost is obviously very, very important, but I think it's, as Neil just highlighted, it's one of a number of elements. And I think it's actually worth, um, I'm very keen that companies go about this whole task in a very, as professional manner as they can. Really. And I think it's actually useful um, developing a set of selection criteria. So think through you know, when you're having discussions with the LSBs, you know, what are the factors that are important um, you know, down to culture, uh, IT systems, even the size of the, the company. That uh, would you, perhaps would you, one of the things you might have to be careful of is: Are you a, a small player with a very big company? And uh, you know, so sometimes it's actually better to work with companies that are of a similar size or a similar culture to yourselves. That, uh, so. Cost is important, but it's only one of a number of uh, things that you should be considering. Yeah, and one of those considerations you mentioned in your presentation and we've discussed before is the location piece and key for our clients. Uh, I've had conversations with clients around looking at moving their warehousing space to the north of England or, or to Scotland to kind of 
um, defer some of those costs. And, and I think that kind of location versus cost dilemma is very important. And, and Paul, in your work with Board Bia, where you've worked with countless of our food companies, can you, can you kind of delve a bit deeper into what our companies should be considering when they're looking at the location for a potential warehouse and weighing up the costs for, uh, of the warehouse space itself versus location? Yeah, I think it comes, again comes back to the, the, the what I would call the cost to serve, which is taking account of all of the cost, getting it across the water and to the to the warehouse, cost of the warehouse, and also the cost of um, distributing to the um, to the customers. Um, obviously, the the, the the cost, the primary transport cost, where hope we would hope they would be large shipments. For container loads or full um, trailer loads, um, so would be perhaps at a, a lower cost per pallet rate than uh, deliveries to the final customers. Um, but <clears throat> uh, one of the things we've got to be careful of at the moment is with the shortage of warehouse space, um, you may not be able to find uh, the location which is your ideal cost to serve. Um, so from an Irish perspective, then if you draw a line between Liverpool and um, Lutterworth, which is the um, uh, sort of center of the, um, the Golden Triangle, then sort of anywhere on that line or you know, not too far either side of it is uh, going to provide a reasonably cost-effective service. But you may have to go further afield, you may have to go up with the M62 or even the M4 going south, to, um, to find the right solution. Things become, I'm not sure, if you're coming from Ireland and going to Scotland to go back to England again, <laughs> that yeah. is quite expensive from a total cost point of view. I mean, so, uh, so think of that uh, total cost to serve. Really. Thanks, Paul. I think that's a really interesting point um, for our companies to consider and conscious again of time. So I'm going to jump to Jack. I see more questions coming in. If you have a couple of questions to pose their panel before we finish up. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I suppose a, a, a good I suppose final, final question uh, to, to try and um, kind of uh, wrap everything up is, is around the kind of uh, state of the market and the, the challenges that, that will be faced towards, uh, towards yourself, Claire. Um, we'd see a lot of questions coming in, I suppose, around is is there is there an end in sight? Um, conscious of a lot of these questions that are that are coming through are quite quite pressing. Um, but with rising inflation costs and supply chain, uh, is this going to be a long term challenge, or is there light at the end of the tunnel? Wow, that, that's a very big question, Jack, and, and I, I'm not an economist. Um, but I, I suppose what I would say uh, is that. Uh, at the UK Warehousing Association, we've built some quite strong relationships with various of the relevant government departments in the UK. Um, so, for example, uh, whilst we know we've got some labour shortages, we are working closely with the Department for Work and Pensions to be more imaginative about where we source people from to work in warehousing uh, and with the Department for Education to make sure that the skills that are available for people um, are more and more appropriate for what it is that we need. Um, and, and similarly, uh, with the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, which is responsible for planning permission, that's another area where, uh, as the trade body, we're lobbying the government to try and help alleviate some of the constraints on the warehousing sector in the UK. So I would encourage Irish companies not to be put, too put off by those, uh, by those constraints uh, and still to consider working with us here in the UK to be able to deliver that better level of customer service that we talked about. That's great to hear. And I might go to Neil as well. <laughs> can I, can I get, get your thoughts as well on the same? From my perspective, in, just so I'm working in the field and um, the where we are at the moment, land values are going they're going very, very, becoming very expensive. We talk about two million pounds an acre for, for land in Lutterworth or sorry, in, in Peterborough for, 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 for warehouse development. Well, that that really means for the 3PL trying to uh, earn a living out of this, the, the, the costs are too prohibitive. So that is actually driving people north. And we've we've seen customers relocate from the likes of Milton Keynes into the northwest. Um, and we can still provide the same delivery, well, we can still meet the same delivery requirement, 
uh, not next, not same day, but definitely next day, um, but on a better cost footing. And in the Northwest, we have quite a strong labor pool, uh, reasonably well skilled, um, that can typically meet the demands. And I think when we're talking about the Irish market, port of entry into the UK, um, with Liverpool, Haysham and uh, Hollyhead, there's plenty of opportunity for Irish companies in the northwest of England. Great, I think um, I think that's all we have time for from the panel discussion side and, and some really great points and conscious be more questions to get to with the following offline. I know there's a couple of questions around bonded warehouses that we didn't get to, unfortunately today and automation that, that we would have liked to discuss. But I just want to really uh, thank Paul, Neil and Claire for joining our panel discussion. Really get, great to get your views and I'm sure well appreciated by your clients and we'll be sure to share your information following today's call and thanks once again just just before we wrap up from our side we just want to give kind of a preview into our next piece of work from enterprise ireland um on this side so jack and i are working across the logistics space and i'll just hand it over to you jack to introduce what's next in line for us Thanks, Kevin. Um, so you can see there on your screen some some information around the work that we're doing uh, re with regards innovation in logistics. So this is a, a separate piece of work that we're doing, which is focusing on warehousing innovation. And we've touched on some of the challenges already today around uh, the warehousing sector in terms of space constraints, the availability of warehousing generally and, and supply chain challenges. And what we've seen is that these issues, while they're a challenge, a challenge for most businesses, uh, these challenges have also created a corresponding opportunity for, for certain companies that will be working in the supply chain, companies that would have capability around things like operational efficiency or automation, digitalization and those sorts of things essentially anything that can create efficiencies in in what we would see as quite a saturated market and for these companies the uk in particular presents uh, a significant opportunity um, for for their expansion so for companies that fit this profile we're carrying out a number of initiatives over the coming months so uh, firstly, we are finalizing a report with an innovation consultancy called Yet2, and as part of this report, we're speaking to some of the major warehousing and logistics providers in the UK, um, some of which you can, you can see on your screen. And this piece of work is around conducting interviews with those providers around their innovation requirements, their pain points, their procurement processes. And we'll be sharing those insights with you uh, in the coming weeks, uh, hopefully via, via a webinar. And then the, the second piece of work, which should be following on from that is we're putting in plans um, for a market study visit to the UK. So our plan for that is to bring uh, a number of Irish companies over to the market, um, particularly companies that are focused on those technological innovations, uh, the efficiencies within the supply chain, um, and to, to have a kind of a knowledge sharing sort of um, uh, event around, around that, that piece of work. So uh, what I would say is if you're interested in hearing more about this work or you're a company that fits in to this profile of work that, that we are doing, uh, I please uh, uh, encourage you to get in touch with either myself or Kevin. And I believe Kevin is gonna share our contact details. So Kevin, back over to you. Lovely. Thanks for that, Jack. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone for joining today's webinar. Really appreciate the engagement throughout and in advance of the webinar. Thanks to our panelists, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and just sharing on screen Jack and I's contact details. Um, we'll be in touch around the next project for companies that may be relevant for. Please do follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn to see what else is coming from our, our UK team over the coming weeks and months. And we will be sure to follow up an email with uh, the pieces that I mentioned earlier, along with the contact details for our kind panelists today. So without um, delaying any longer, thanks a million for joining us. I'm, I'm sure we're all looking forward to lunch from our side. So um, have a good day and thanks again to everyone for joining. See ya. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.